Hello everyone, this is Dr. Brittany Martin with the American Marketing Association. Our final keynote speaker will be JD, who has experience with experience design. There are so many touch points in our lives that are near impossible to cover every aspect in just one talk. In this keynote, we'll look at today, uh, it will cover relevant digital experience such as digital out of home and social media. Before we get started, I wanted to give you guys some special instructions for this session. We would like you to expand your video panel. We're going to actually push your slides through the video panel and you'll also be able to see your speaker in the console. By dragging the bottom right hand corner of your video panel, you should be able to have a full experience from JD today. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into this presentation. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, we had some fun prior to this uh, this meeting starting, and um, so I appreciate you guys uh, switching things up on the fly here. Uh, but again, this is it, entire conference is about experience design. Uh, so this experience that you guys are having right now, um, I'm hoping is going to be a good one. Um, so. As you know, the slides, we will be still looking at the slides. We're gonna do it a little differently. I'm gonna incorporate the slides into this camera um, scene that you see right here, which is why we asked you to make the screen as large as it can be. Um, and the other thing I'm gonna ask is uh, just so to help you guys with your internet experience, um, turn off any of the browsers that you have running that you don't need, um, stop other programs that might slow your computer, shut down Netflix or Hulu if you're catching up on your shows. Uh, just, just give me about 45 minutes here. Um, make this screen nice and big so we can, we can keep the, uh, the, the, the conference going to round out the last, uh, the last keynote of this presentation. So um, I just want to be, you know, I want to be this, this to be as interactive as possible. In order to do that, I'm going to need you guys, um, first of all, uh, paying attention and we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions and we're going to have some, um, uh, some game time in here. So you guys can put your answers in the chat box. Um, and, and the way to do that is, is to, to be fully attentive and have the screen nice and large. Uh, the theme of the conference is experience design. As you can see from the graphics that I have up here, it's not going to be your typical webinar. Uh, and I'm hoping that, um, this particular keynote will change that perception of what a webinar is. I have one goal for this talk, um, all right, maybe two. And I know later on when I get to my slides, you're going to see like the mandatory, you know, the three goals for this conversation today are, but really my main goal here today is, is to have fun. And I really want you guys to have fun as well. Um, right off the bat, everything that's happened so far has been completely off script. Uh, I can promise you, I will probably see a shiny coin and turn the conversation elsewhere. Um, I'm going to be looking at the chat box and, uh, and interacting with you guys there as well. I may even pull up some of your comments um, into the conversation as well. Uh, so again, this is going to be as interactive as, 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 as interactive as you guys are in this conversation as well too, but we are going to have fun. <clears throat> And really what I want you to do um, for this for this talk, what I would like to do for you guys is to show you something that maybe you haven't seen before, uh, maybe something you haven't thought about so that when you leave here today, you have a different mindset than when you came in, okay? And maybe if you look at what you're doing in your life or in your business and your job or whatever it may be, you may look through with a different lens and hopefully it'll spark something amazing. Uh, so... Let's see. Stephanie's already Stephanie's already comment on here. We're bring we're bringing the fun. We're bringing fun. Yes, yeah, Stephanie. Um, so uh, what we're going to do here is, if you could see behind the camera here, um, I've got three monitors going here, and and I'm because of uh, the way this is going to work. I'm running my slides in here, so I have PowerPoint running the slides here. I've got the chat box down below. I'm I'm going to be changing graphics on the screen, so bear with me as as we do this. And I promise you, um, it'll be a, it'll be a fun experience for you guys. No pun intended on that one. Uh, so let's bring this in here. You guys should see my slides now. <laughs> um, my name is JD Gargano. I'm a brand strategist and a creative director for a digital media company called Captivate. 
Uh, what's Captivate? Uh, well, if you've ever gotten into a, an elevator into uh, in a high rise building and um, you saw a screen that was on the sides of the doors, maybe on the inside, that's a Captivate screen. But have you ever walked into an elevator that didn't have one of those? And maybe there was two, three, four other people that were in there that you didn't know. And what's everybody doing? They're staring at the ceiling. They're staring at the floor. Maybe maybe they have their phone in their hands. It's awkward. Elevators are awkward. You know, they can be awkward anyway. And some 20 years ago, the founders of Captivate really sought a way to break up that awkwardness and create a better elevator experience for everybody, right? So what they do? This is what they did. They found a way to put what happened to the beard? I shaved. I had to. Quarantine. I just didn't want to have that quarantine look, Karen, but thank you for noticing. Um, so what they did was they they put a screen inside an elevator. So now that when people get into the elevator, they're now captivated by looking at this information that's in front of them, right? Uh, so this here is a Captivate screen. We have about 12,000 screens in uh, 1,600 Class A buildings across North America. Uh, we have about 13 million monthly viewers. It's a lot of eyeballs. It's a lot of people looking at the screen, and we have a big job on our end to make sure that the information that we put on those screens is relevant, timely, informative, um, and 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 really breaks through um, to the people that are in the in the elevators that capture their attention. Uh, so in the top right-hand corner there, uh, that's where our ad window is. And we have a lot of regional and local ads, everything from the Amazons and the Googles of the world uh, to the mom and pop coffee shops that are in the lower level of the buildings that they're in. Even they can put ads on, on our Captivate screens that kind of promote you know, whatever specials they have for the day. Come on downstairs and get your cup of coffee kind of a thing. Uh, underneath that ad window, we have the content area. And that content, we have live editors that curate the content throughout the day. Everything from sports and news and weather, entertainment, uh, traffic, uh, all that stuff is is done um, on a on a several hour basis, and all done with real people that will take those headlines and information and put them in there. And in the top left, you got your time and temperature widget, which is one of the most uh, looked at things when people get inside the elevators. They want to see what time it is. They want to know how nice it is outside. Um, so that's, this is the, the elevator, uh, experience that, that you have when you're in a Captivate slide. I, I haven't progressed anything. You should probably just still see the Captivate experience, Debbie. <clears throat> there we go. So now what is experience design? Well, you guys have been here for two days now, and you've heard a lot of people speak about experience design. And if you ask 10 people, what is experience design? You'll probably get 10 different answers, right? And some may look like this a design practice focused on human outcomes or making technology easy to use or human-centered design. I've even found this long one here. It says the process of manipulating user behavior through usability, usefulness, desirability, provided in the interaction with a project or with a product. That's a really good one. Uh, so typically with experience design or user experience design, it's got to start somewhere, right? And it may look something like this. It starts, it should should start in a discovery session or a design sprint, right? Where, where people get together and the client gets together and you run a facilitation session and you kind of de dive deep into uh, the user base. And, and from there, things like this start to form where you get the wireframing of what this product is going to start to look like and that you start to visualize what this can be. And then it turns into eventually a fully functional app or a product, whatever that website or whatever the use case is. Um, that's kind of typically the, the stages that uh, they go through. So what about something like this? There we go. What about something like this, right? If you were listening to the talks yesterday, um, I believe it was uh, Russ had talked about some of the first um, experiential designs uh, were churches, right? And um, I, I, museums and art galleries are definitely in that category too. As a uh, patron who goes to one of these things, you're experiencing the entire atmosphere that's around you. And in, in this case, this, this wall is painted a certain color to make that portrait stand out or to mute it so that the portrait is the, 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 the most front facing thing and, and it focuses all your attention to it. So the T-shaped design. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of the um, museums, museums and art galleries, hundred percent 
are excellent experiential design um, outsources for, for, for people. But how about something like this? How about a concert, right? When you think about a concert, you people usually just go in to listen to their favorite bands or artists and they hope to hear their favorite songs live, right? But there are bands who take their live show experience and really incorporate the fans into the whole show. And yesterday, uh, Don was talking about this um, with, with, with festivals like Bonnaroo and Coachella. And it really, it really takes music and art to a whole new level. And, and it gets the audience really engaged in the, in the experience that you have there is something that you'll never forget, right? So this right here, this is the band Fish from New Year's Eve in 2017. And when everybody walked into the uh, Madison Square Garden, this was at Madison Square Garden, when everybody walked into Madison Square Garden, they received one of these. It was a bracelet. And you didn't know what it was for. You had no idea. You just they, they told everybody to wear these bracelets on their hands. And it wasn't until it wasn't until a few minutes before midnight when people started to realize exactly what that was for. And as you'll see in this video here, <clears throat> This is probably about 15 minutes before midnight. While the band is playing, a stage crew came out and started to assemble something on the stage, right? And then all of a sudden, everybody's bracelets started lighting up. And it was absolutely incredible. They had no idea that it was going to do that. And what's even more incredible is that the lighting director for the band Fish has full control over those bracelets. And he is the one that's piping through all of the, the designs and the colors and the information that's going into them to incorporate that into what the band is doing on stage. And you'll see that in a little bit. But as the band is playing here, the stage starts to transform into a pirate ship. And it was incredible. And it was, it's, it's, it, to be a part of that and to experience something like that is, is unlike anything that you probably would normally see at a normal concert. But this is the same level of, uh, oh my God moments that they bring to their shows. They do this several times a year. They do New Year's Eve and they do crazy gags like this and they do Halloween shows, but they really bring their fan base into the whole experience and they immerse them. And look at this. These are, this is the LED lights on people's bracelets that are being controlled that I was telling you about. It's incredible. And you can sure f f bet that nobody who went to that show will ever forget that experience at that moment. And you can see that these set designers are, are, are uncovering some uh, some cannons. And as you'll watch, one of the cannons is going to be fed kind of like this disco ball here. Again, this is New Year's Eve, so it's party themed. And they're going to load it into the cannon. And you'll see what happens when uh, when they launch it. So they fire the cannon. And how do they make it seem like the cannon exploded? Boom, they have an explosion in the crowd as if that cannonball hit that area. It's crazy. And then they count down to the New Year's Eve. Um, and you'll see here in a second, nothing but lots of confetti and, and balloons. So this is, again, just taking that experience design to a, a completely different level for, for something that's as, just a as, as run-of-the-mill concert, which would normally build, be just a run-of-the-mill concert. You go and you listen to your music and that's it. Not this band. So, according to that, um, according to the last definition that we had here, we're just going to look and see if this concert kind of checks off some of those boxes. Um, so we talked about the experience design is manipulating user behavior through usability. In this case, is the value that you get from going to that concert, and I would say, yeah, that definitely checks that off. Um, how about the usefulness of the purpose? Well, for the band, the whole purpose of this was to interact in a way with, with their fans that that's not normally done before. And they always bring that there. So hundred um, percent purpose was definitely met uh, on this from both the band and the fan side and the desirability. You can guarantee that the next time you go and see that fish is coming around or if your favorite band, if they did this, you're going to try to get tickets to that show. New Year's Eve is the mo most sought after ticket and the highest price ticket uh, because they count down the new years and they always have this little gag that goes on. So 100% experience design all around with the interaction from this product, in this case, the interaction with the concert itself. 
Uh, Bonnie, I, I have um, in 97 when I went, they had massive giant balloons and I took one. I actually still have it. Um, there's no air left in it, but it's a giant balloon. I'm not even kidding. I've never seen a balloon so big in my life. <clears throat> Next time you'll have to go to one and, and take one with you. So some ways, I think one of the main drivers of experience design has got to be emotions. And it's the emotion that the, the, the story gives, that the story tells. Uh, it's, it's what changes your perception of something or how you feel about what you're seeing. Um, and actually, before, before I um, get into that, this is a little bit curveball side, side story, but it kind of relates back to the emotion part of it. Uh, I took my son to see his very first concert uh, last year. We went last summer and it was to a fish concert and we went to um, Boston. Uh, we went to Fenway to go see fish. His birthday was in June. So I got him the tickets and we went uh, in July. It was July 5th and 6th. And he was so excited. He, he was really excited to go. And I knew that for his first concert ever, he's, he was 12, um, it would be memorable and he would remember it and it would be something that he would never forget. But as a designer and a father who wanted to try to make that a, a little better than just going to the concert, um, what I did was I made, uh, I made these shirts to commemorate his very first show. So I took the design of what normally would be um, a Boston jersey and I used the same font. And um on there as well and then this is the two of us whoops this is the two of us right before we went to the to the show and his face was it, he, he just was smiling he was oh no we lost audio oh audio cut out we're back now okay um so if, if you missed if you missed what i was saying um i made these shirts for um to commemorate the 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 show that we went to uh, just to give his memory, something a little extra that he'll never forget. So that's, that's, that was the short story in case you missed it. <clears throat> All right, back to the, back to the slides. I think we're good, Brittany, right? We're good. Okay. <clears throat> so getting back to emotions and how emotions can um, dictate the experience for people who are uh, seeing something, maybe like your product or an ad, right? <clears throat> Here we go. This right here is a black and white photo of this woman looking behind her. Maybe she left someone, but she feels like it's not over. Uh, but you can kind of get a sense uh, of, of what she's feeling in that moment by looking at this photo, right? You got this nice handwritten font, I will always find you, the mood of the picture itself. Now to show you how all of this comes into play with how we experience something, I'm going to take the same photo. I'm going to take the same words. We're going to make a few tweaks and we're going to change the experience for you and for her in this case too. Ah, there we go. So what happened? Changed, right? It's the same words. It's the same image. I cheated a little. I showed you a little bit more of the image and I kind of put that creepy guy in the background, but the experience for everyone changed, even though most of the message is rooted from the same elements that are there. I will always find you. Creeper. Exactly. But again, the only things that really changed was the design of it. The font made this kind of like stalker, you know, murderous, I will always find you. And this guy is now chasing this woman. So the meaning behind the whole thing changed. The experience of this whole, ex this whole image has now changed. Can we do a side by side? Well, that's a good call. Man, you really are. Hang on. Hang on. Let's see. I don't know if I could do a side by side, but I can go back and forth. Oh, creepy. I will always find you. Ah, I will always find you. Arr. Totally creepy. Um, you good? All right, good. Thanks. Where was I? Oh, yes. Okay. Game time. We're going to play a little game here, okay? This is where I want everybody to uh, put some answers in the chat here, okay? Um, it's going to be an A or B. 
Yeah, it makes a difference when you don't see the dude in the background as well, but it makes a huge difference when you do see him. <clears throat> All right, game time. Here we go. I want you to look at this product. Tell me, which shampoo was more expensive, A or B? In the chat, I want you guys to put your answers in there now, A or B. Yeah, A, right? We got A. Sure. Why not? <clears throat> All right. Which coffee is the strongest? Oh, Tracy. Tracy's already going there. Which coffee is the strongest, A or B? What do we see here? Ooh, I love the interactivity, guys. A. Coffee A. That's right. All right. How about this? Which cookie brand has the healthiest ingredients? This is the last one. Which cookie brand has the healthiest ingredients? If I had Jeopardy music, I'd play it. Ooh, okay. Answers are coming in. B. B, of course. Yes. Yes, B, healthiest ingredients for sure. No doubt about it. Why? Why did you guys answer it that way? No, oh, we still got cookie B on the screen. Sorry. <clears throat> it's because it, yeah, it looks tastier, it looks healthier. It's because we are conditioned based on emotion and our experience with shopping to choose those, right? One of the things that you have to think about is what you have in your head already going into uh, shopping, for example, okay? As marketers and as business owners, you have to think of that. I guarantee you what you probably didn't notice is that in all of those products, Are they all right here in all of those products the logo and the copy are exactly the same nothing is different about it it's the packaging it's the presentation okay it is it is it, it's it's ingrained in you so that when you see this really nice looking high end bottle that you think it's the most expensive if it's if it's the coffee that's on the side it's the loud explosive ah, i have more caffeine than everything else and the cookie the last box there it's the most minimalist it's nice looking it's probably something you'd see in trader joe's or whole foods so what does this tell you well it tells you that you only get one chance at a first impression right? If this was your company, if this was your brand, if this was your service, what would happen? If you're not speaking to the audience or the target audience that you're looking for, you're missing the opportunity and you're losing out to your competitor who's doing the right thing. Andrew, you could read the ingredients. Sure, I didn't give you that option. <laughs> but as you can see here, it is it is the full package, the full package experience that you get that automatically drew you to a conclusion that you really didn't know. But because of, of, of your, 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 your preconditions to decide that based on those prompts, that's what you chose. <clears throat> so here it is. This is what I was talking about before. The, the three goals for today. <clears throat> We're going to define user experience. Um, we gave a couple of user experience, uh, experience design definitions, I'm sorry, uh, in the beginning, but we're going to define experience design as it relates to digital out of home and social or social media, right? And we're going to talk about how a well-designed experience can resonate with an audience. And we'll also talk about how experience design can really help you stand out. So, what we got here? Most of us here are marketers. So we know this gentleman here, 
Seth Godin. If you don't, I suggest you write his name down. I suggest you listen to his podcast, get a couple of his books. The man is a genius. He's got some, he will drop knowledge bombs on you all day long. Your head will spin. But one of the things that he said that I thought was really, really important, um, not only to the topic of this conversation that we're having here, but also what's going on uh, in today's world, it's when we think about what might go wrong, we're more likely to design something that goes right. Think about that for a second. When we think about what might go wrong, in the case of the labels that I showed you, what might go wrong is that you will lose to your competitors, your product will not get chosen, your service will be overlooked. And if we think about that, we are more likely to design something that goes right. How many companies or how many brands or how many people were not prepared for what just happened at the beginning of this year? Almost everybody, right? No one ever would have thought there was a pandemic that was going to happen. That is, the, that is the so far extreme case of what could go wrong, but it's something to think about. And I guarantee you that everybody will be thinking about that now, right? So we'll just keep this in our head as we roll through the rest of this presentation, but I also want you to think about it as you roll through the rest of your life and moving on with your, with your companies and business. <clears throat> so, yeah, except Bill Gates, exactly. So we're going to define uh, user experience as it relates, uh, I keep saying user experience, I apologize, experience design as it relates to um, this particular talk here today. Uh, so we're going to define it as simply as this. It's the look, the feel, and the story of your product or service as it relates to those who are observing it. Easy enough, right? So here's an example of a digital out-of-home. Uh, this was a billboard. This was done by... Um, BBC for their show Dracula. And when you look at this, um, keep in mind that the experience of this billboard changes over time. And you'll see what I mean in a second here. So it's for the show ja Dracula. Obviously, you know, stakes are the things that kill Dracula. So when you look at this thing, it just kind of looked like haphazardly thrown all over the place. But as day turns to night and as the, the lights shine on this thing, I'm going to play that again so you guys can see it. It turned into, oh man, I love that I can control the slides. Sorry, Brittany. Look at this. Those stakes formed Dracula's face. Brilliant. It's amazing. I, I, I could watch this thing over and over all day because it was just so cool when I saw this. But imagine experiencing this. Imagine being on the streets in London and you're walking and you're looking at a billboard and it may just look normal. You're like, oh, okay, whatever. And then as you're walking home from work or maybe you're going to get something to eat, that billboard changes. It's like, holy cow, that's not what I saw a couple hours ago. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. I appreciate it. Again, bringing experience design up a whole new level and really making you top of mind when people are thinking about what am I going to sit down and watch tonight? So we're going to talk about experiences, experiences that resonate, right? We want to design uh, these experiences that resonate with your audience. And one way to do that is to build user personas. You need to dive deep into the mindset, the habits, the lifestyle, and the routine of your target audience, your potential audience, your growth audience, whoever it is, you need to really dive deep into what it is that they're thinking at that moment. And you need to think about what it is that they're going to like. What is it that they won't like? What will they need right now or in six months or in a year? Because when you figure that kind of stuff out, then you could start to, f I really understand how it's going to make them feel. We're going to touch a little bit on COVID-19 towards the end of this talk, but I think a lot of businesses did a phenomenal job thinking about what the, what the end user feels. And some businesses, as you know, didn't do that quite as good. <clears throat> so how can experience design make you stand out? Well, I showed you a couple of examples now, but again, just to get your mind thinking, we're going to kind of steer a little bit left here uh, on a couple of these and you're going to say where did this come from but again it's just going to help you think outside the box and i just want you to keep that in mind i came before I, before i was a captivate i came from traditional television i worked for uh, a television media company tribune which has about 50 stations across the country i worked in the flagship station uh, pix 11 in new york 
And I've also done work for WSFL in Florida, WDCW in DC. Um, uh, what was it? WGN America, WGN nine in Chicago. I helped launch original programming there for WGN America. But as you know, before the pandemic happened, TV ratings were declining because of things like social media, because of things like Hulu and Netflix. Um, those are rising now that we're saying at home, but analysts and experts say that that's probably going to go back down once things start leveling out. We'll see. We don't know. But digital out of home, for the purpose that we're talking about today, here's some pros for advertising with digital out of home and building a good experience design. It has a larger reach. People aren't home as often as they are. Again, pre-COVID-19, people weren't home as often as they are. So how do we reach those people who are not in front of their TVs anymore? Digital out of home, billboards, things like Captivate and the elevator screens. <clears throat> it's always brand safe. What do I mean by brand safe? Well, if you notice on the Captivate screen, there was an ad and there was some content underneath. If you were a brand who was sensitive to some news or information and you didn't want to be aligned with specific pieces of content, <laughs> it's not DOH, D-O-O-H. <clears throat> um, that was responding to Marion in the chat there. Uh, the content that a brand could be aligned with, we control that. So we can put something, if you don't want a specific news piece aligned with your ad, or if you didn't want a competing information, if let's say you were brand X and the stories that were in the news were about brand Y, we can exclude those. So they're never competing against each other. So that's what we mean by brand safe. Fraud free for digital out of home. There is no fingers that can click on your uh, banners to give you false impressions. It's always there. It's present. You can't miss it. And it's not skippable. It's not like YouTube pre-roll or post-roll. It's visible uh, at all times, 100% viewable, right? So obviously there's got to be some cons to digital at home, right? Just like anything else. It oftentimes needs to be custom built. For somebody like myself who's a designer, that's great for me. Sometimes. Because the deliverables list is super long because there's no standardization. You've got billboards that are long and skinny, or now you have, you know, you have landscape billboards and portrait billboards, and you've got things on the sides of buses and the back of TV uh, uh, taxi cabs. There is no standardization. With television, you know exactly what you have to design to. So the customization can run uh, pretty high there. Here's the other thing. Oftentimes there's no sound in the in digital at home environments, right? Those billboards, they can't play audio. Captivate doesn't have audio in the, in the elevators. So you have to tell your story through visuals uh, and through the emotions that you can bring out of people by visuals and words. <clears throat> so you can't rely on a soundtrack. And here's something that I really didn't even think about, sign laws. Let's say you're big tobacco. You can't put an ad within 500 feet of schools. So if you're trying to reach a certain audience, you're out of luck. Right? Every state, every county, every town has sign laws and you must adhere to them if you're digital at home. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so when it comes to digital at home, we're always trying to find new ways to enhance experiences, right? Some ways we do that is with facial recognition. I'm not going to dive too deep in, into much of this stuff. Um, it's, it's just a ton of information that you can get on there. I can certainly talk more about it with you if you want to have a conversation, but I just want to bring it to some of your, to your attention here. Some of the ways that digital at home is experience is being enhanced. Facial recognition, audio voice, geofencing. Geofencing is basically um, there's devices that are in buildings or in the cloud that kind of blanket an area or a building. And that device will capture um, user behavior, information from your phones. It knows your shopping behaviors and patterns and stuff like that. So that's what geofencing is. And as a result of geofencing, that's how we can retarget ads. That's how you go to work and you're shopping for shoes uh, on your work computer. And when you go home, all of a sudden that shows up on your phone, that's retargeting ads. This here is an ad uh, that we did for degree specifically built for the elevator experience. Um, so I run the studio team at Captivate and we worked with the agency to custom build this message for their, uh, for their audience, which were people inside the elevators. And their whole campaign was around how hot it could be and degree will still keep working for you, right? 
So here you go. It just says, if it works in the desert, you know it'll work in a crowded elevator. And their tagline, so it says it works in, in heat up to 125 degrees. And then at the bottom, we're able to dynamically pipe through the temperature for the location that you're in. So this changed everywhere in the, in the, in the country that this ad played. It played the weather specific to that area. So again, speaking to a specific audience that's being targeted in the elevators. Another example that we did, this is this is uh, this screen that you're seeing here. Uh, so Captivate has elevator screens, which you saw, but they also have large format screens, uh, which can sit in lobbies, it can sit in office buildings, they're just, you know, a 60 by 9 format that can play anywhere. Uh, and this was an ad that we built for Whole Foods, they wanted to do a drive to location. So in order to make that happen for them, we were able to pipe in the nearest location. They told us where their stores were, and based on where their buy was, what buildings they wanted to select, we were able to, to pipe in the nearest location for them. And the creative changed. So in this one, there's a bento box, but they had sandwiches, they had soups. Um, I think they had uh, this, this bento box and they had a noodle bowl. But the messaging changed and the hashtags changed based on the creative that was on that left-hand panel as well. So let's talk about social, social media and social, uh, other social outputs. I was really, really excited um, when Don spoke about Twitch yesterday and he spoke about gamers because I'm going to show you a slide in that in a second um, because it's a real thing and and your vision of what, uh, what a gamer is is probably vastly different than what a gamer really is. Um, it's not somebody that's sitting in their their mom's basement anymore um, playing video games all the time. These people who make some serious money, and I will show you in a second. Um, so from a social perspective, how are some ways that we can enhance the experience for people uh, who are using their phones or using Instagram or using Facebook? Well, I think one of the things that you've probably seen over the last year that's been really big, before I get into that, we're going to talk about some pros. See? Yeah. Um, Yes, Chelsea, 100 percent, and I'll explain that and why in a second. Yes, Stephanie, 100 percent also. Uh, so real quickly, some pros of social media, massive reach, right? We all know the power of social media. We know how a tweet can blow up and 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 reach across the world instantaneously. Same thing with videos that are going viral on TikTok and Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, whatever the case may be. We know that the reach is massive on there and we know it's super cost effective. It does not cost much to put together a tweet or to put together a really nicely designed element on Instagram. You really have this great opportunity to partner with other brands and brand ambassadors to extend your reach even further. And it has a high conversion rate because it's super easy while you're looking at an ad to click on it and go to the page, go to the shopping cart, take you to wherever landing pages that they want you to see. So what are some cons of social media? I think we know a lot of these cons. It could be a lot of work to maintain. If you're a marketer, you know that you're working. If you're a digital marketer, you know that there's Facebook that you have to maintain, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, all the ones we talked about. So there's a lot of platforms with a lot of different audiences that the message has to be catered to specifically. Right, that multiple platforms have different audiences. Toxicity runs rampant. I think we all know this, and it's time bound. Right? How long does a tweet last? How long does an Instagram post last? Not that long. Not as long as digital at home. Right? So here, this is what I was talking about in the last year. People may have noticed these carousels were a really big thing uh, on social media, and it was a really engaging way to tell more of the story in more than one picture. So, for example, this car right here found a creative way to show how big the interior of the vehicle is, how pretty it is, and the view that you can see. So a lot of people are doing some really, really, really cool things with carousels. Interaction, here's Wayfair. Wayfair makes it super easy to shop with them all in their post. Built into Instagram, they have these little tags that you can click on, which will give you more information about the lamp or the table or the chair, and it takes you immediately to the page if you wanna go and buy it. Their traffic increased threefold just by doing stuff like this. Again, I want you to just start thinking about these things as you're thinking about some of the, 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 the next campaigns that you're working on or ways to elevate or extend your reach of your brand or service. Now, this is where we're going to get into, in, into the gaming aspect of it. The next time your child tells you that they want to play video games 
for their job, take them a little more seriously. <laughs> Don't let them drop out of school. But think about this for a second. The gaming world in the last several years has exploded. And e-gaming, e-sports is real. We talked, to, Don talked a little bit about it yesterday. This right here is, this guy's name is Dr. Disrespect. He is probably one of the um, top streamers on Twitch. This guy has built an elaborate show out of his entire streaming. He is literally, all he is doing is literally sitting in front. If you strip it down, he is sitting in front of his computer screen playing video games. While that may seem boring, he said, I'm going to take this up a notch. And he developed an entire show around it. He developed an entire personality around it. This guy looks like he's standing in like a shooting range at the bottom here. He looks like he's standing in a Gillette studio. Gillette, guess what? That's sponsorship money for him. Great exposure for Gillette. He's in his room. He's in a room in his home with a green screen behind him and some really high-end graphics that makes this experience so desirable. And it nets him giant my, mine too, Kelly. Believe me, I'm, I'm going through this too. My 12-year-old wants to do this too. Giant money funnels his way. I'm going to show you this. You, you guys, you're not even going to believe this. Dr. Disrespect. He streams between five and 10 hours a day. Okay. Every time this guy streams, 25 to 50,000 viewers are watching him on Twitch alone every day. Imagine if you had 25 to 50,000 people looking at your brand every single day like that. He has 30,000 subscribers on Twitch alone. That is a paid service. People pay him to unlock special features that uh, are enabled in the Twitch platform that enhance their experience a little more, whether it's an emoji that he that they get or some special time because he may set time. Some, some um, streamers will set certain hours for subscribers only so that you can go in and watch and, and interact with them more. But it's a paid service. And because of that, this guy makes $100,000 a month in subscriptions only. Every single one of us that are in this conversation right now are probably rethinking their job that they want to do. Go out and kick your kids off of your Xbox and start playing right now, right? It's a job though. It's a job. It's a lot of work. But if you start to think about this in a different way, it may open opportunities for you and your business, your service, your product, whatever that you might not have thought of before. And I'm telling you this right now, especially with, yes, Alyssa, especially with COVID-19, people, the numbers have gone through the roof. NBA teams who are no longer able to play their games are playing their seasons on Twitch. That's where ad dollars are going and moving to. 16-year-old kid that won Fortnite, $3 million in Fortnite, 100%. It's crazy. But I want you to think about this for you guys. It's for your business and how you can apply things like this in a different way. Let's talk about how we can use data to build better experiences. Give me one second while I get a sip, sorry. It's really dry here in New Hampshire. <laughs> Marion, I'll watch Pac, Mrs. Pac-Man, Mr. Pac-Man. I'll watch Atari 2600 all day. People don't do it enough on Twitch. I want my Atari 2600 out of my father's basement and I will play that on Twitch. I guarantee you we'll get a lot of people to watch too. <clears throat> so how do we build user, uh, how do we build um, uh, better experiences with data? Well, here we go. There's a company out there called Deep Vision. And Deep Vision uses AI to scan brands, right? It can recognize brands and collect that information. So this, this right here can recognize Starbucks cups in your hand cars. As cars are passing through cameras, it can capture the make, the model, the year, the brand, all of this information about your vehicle. It's pretty interesting when you think about it. Here's an example of this, this company that's using this and how it collects that information. As these, as these vehicles are passing through the cameras, it's got the make and model, the year that it is, this is the passenger, like a how long of exposure time that they were for a, at a billboard in front, whether they're a stop sign or not. It's really, really cool. What can we do with this? What can we do with this information? Well, let's go back to the Starbucks one for a second. Let's say you're Dunkin' Donuts. 
right? And you want to know how many people in an area are drinking Dunkin' Donuts, uh, are drinking Starbucks. Because what you want to do is you want to tailor your ad in New York City in Times Square to the people who are down below drinking a Starbucks right now and say, hey, come into Dunkin' Donuts. We're literally right behind you. Our coffee's cheaper, tastes better, whatever, whatever the case may be. But that's how you could use that information to help you target your audience in a very specific way. So here's an example of this. This is a, this is a company that's doing this with Porsche. I'll let you watch this for a second. So as regular cars are driving underneath the billboard, it's just a standard ad. Here, Motor Trend Car of the Year, whatever the case may be. But when the camera recognizes a Porsche is going through, at the stop, let me mean a little bit beforehand, it does something very different. It tailors the message to the Porsche driver. Pretty cool. Pretty creepy, but pretty cool. Just to give it a little extra touch, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be looking at billboards, but it's big enough where you kind of notice it. And it's not like it's a long billboard, um, but it works. It's effective. It just, it makes you feel a little better as a Porsche driver. If you're driving this and you see it, it's like, oh, they're talking to me. Again, enhancing that experience for Porsche owners, right? <clears throat> Yes, it is very creepy. But Peter, listen, we're in the world of technology and it is moving so fast that there you can do things obviously to 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 stop that, but then your experience is diminished. Right? Your brand, if you're if you're running a company, that that brand can can you're losing out to your competitors who are using this information. So just keep that in mind. Really, really quickly, whoo, 46 minutes, really, really quickly. I just want to talk, um, you know, with everything that's going on in, in, in today's world with COVID-19, um, there's, there's right ways and wrong ways to navigate these difficult times, right? And I think we're all aware of that. I think we all know that. But I just want to just point out a couple of the ones that um, have been doing really well or, or companies that have not changed their image, have not changed their brand or not changed their core values, but still put out a good message out there and keep the integrity of the brand. So here is like Nike. If you ever dreamed of playing for millions around the world, now's your chance. Play for the world, play inside, right? Who else took a massive hit during this whole COVID-19 like the travel industry and hotels and Airbnb and airlines and boating and the auto industry? It's massive. So what Hotels.com did was they said, all right, well, we have this, we have our icon Captain Obvious here. And there he, there he is. He's staying inside. And they really took the tone of the message down, staying true to their brand, staying true to their core values. But they said, listen, we're going to take some time off of this. And you should too. Right? So that's a smart way of doing it. I know you guys have seen companies, brands, people that are taking advantage of the situation or not quite hitting the mark. I'm not calling, obviously, anybody out on this. You guys have your own ideas of what you think works and doesn't work. I think we can all agree it's people who are doing this, right? Taking their names and stretching it out like that for the sake of stretching it out like that because we're all social distancing. We get it. Um, but I think it's very self-serving. I think a lot of people agreed with that as well. Uh, bad timing on ads or visuals or copy is there was a lot of companies that were scrambling to pull ads off the air, like people hugging and shaking hands and licking their fingers after eating food. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it, it happens, right? I think that's that that um, it's time to to look at what you're saying in these times and change those ideas and change those messages to think about the way people are going to feel. Again, emotion, emotion is what's driving the experience for these people. And if you keep that in mind, then you won't go wrong, right? Really quick recap because I really want to. You guys have been so good in the in, in the chat. I really want to want to talk with uh, with a few of you if you have any questions. So really quick, <clears throat> experience design should be built with the end user in mind. Obviously, we're talking about their emotions. You want to think about the person who is going to be looking at or experiencing your brand service or whatever it is that you have to offer. We want them people that we want those people top of mind. Uh, we talked about some really good ways to use data to to build hyper targeted audience experiences. Right. Think outside the box. Think outside your comfort zone, and I promise you, you will reach new heights. Think of Dr. Disrespect. He took 
what would normally be this boring, mundane dude sitting in his room in front of a computer screen playing games and turned it into a massive, massive show for himself. <clears throat> Tread lightly when it comes to designing around negative events. Just keep that in mind. That's all I really want to say about that. We're going to open up to Q&A and have a quick conversation. Before we do that, though, I'm going to do something a little special for you guys. You guys have been so awesome. I really, really appreciate it. The AMA has been so awesome to have me here. I really thank you guys very much for that as well. If you text experience design to 31996 right now, the first seven people, you and I are going to have a free 45-minute consult. We're going to talk about design and marketing as it relates to your business because you guys are awesome. And I really, really hope to carry the conversation further with you guys. So the first seven people, let's see what you got. Let's do it. Thank you all so much. This has been an amazing two days. This has been an amazing time. I can't wait to do it again. I hope that you guys are leaving here with your heads exploding with all this information and, and valuable insights you got from everybody that spoke in these past two days. Um, you know how to find me. I've been having these graphics up on the screen the whole time. LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. I don't have Facebook. It's the devil. Uh, but you guys know how to get a hold of me. And thank you so much. Brittany, let's do this. Okay. Brittany, why are you smiling? So you have quite Thanks. a few questions that have come in. <laughs> I, always, I always try to smile. Uh oh. I'm not lagging too much on your end. Chastity. Uh, that's right. Uh oh. Let's see. Can you hear okay? I can hear you. Do something fun for audience. Yeah. Marnie, I can see you in your. Uh oh. All right, so um, if you guys can still hear me, I know Brittany's um, Brittany's starting to 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 crash on her audio a little here, but I think I think she's going to ask this. Uh, this was a question that came from um, yeah. from Chastity, I believe, and Chastity says, "What books would you recommend to expand on this particular topic?" <sighs> That's really good. Um, I know there's a lot of good marketing uh, books that are out there. Right now I'm reading uh, This is Marketing by Seth Godin. Uh, that's a really, really good uh, book. Um, if you want to dive more into user personas and uh, learn more about design sprints, there's a book by Jake Knapp called Sprint. That's excellent um, as well to learn a little bit more about some of the things that we talked about. <clears throat> And if you can hear me now, is there a oh, good way now. to? Oh, perfect. <laughs> we have Marnie on standby, by the way, just in case. So from Scott, is there a good way to reduce poor reception um, for intruding into places where ads did not exist previ previously? That's a great question. Um, you know, the experience that we all have uh, with these ads is, is it varies, right? Everybody has their own personal uh, taste on what's too much or what's too intrusive or what's too creepy. Um, there are ways to to get around some of that stuff, but again, there are ways that you're not going to be able to get around that stuff. Um, for example, like the billboards, that's that's something that uh, companies are, are are doing. It's very real. It's not, it's not fake stuff. Uh, they are surveying some of the, the products that we use and, and, and displaying that information in real time. Um, there's, uh, yeah, there really isn't, there isn't much you could, you could do about the intrusion of it. You know, obviously, you know, that there's things that you could do on your phones to minimize uh, how much information leaves, um, browser stuff, using VPNs and all that stuff. But there, there, there's, there's still ways to capture information, believe it or not. All right. Great. And our third question is, GDPR and CCPA will definitely impact these efforts and how we uh, interact with our current marketplace. Can you talk a little bit about how those are going to have implications for our company? You know, 
I wish I had a good answer for you on that stuff. I really do. Um, I haven't been too well versed in the GDPR uh, guidelines and regulations. I know when it comes from um, uh, from a web standpoint, it's really easy to put that notification at the bottom of your screen. Um, but I, I really don't have a good answer for you on that one. I, I I apologize, but I can definitely look into it and, and get back to you on that one. All right. And we've had about 10 or 15 people ask so far, so I'm going to throw it out there. What type of webcam equipment are you using? <laughs> um, it's funny that you asked that because uh, this this past week I was actually on a, uh, on a, on a YouTube show. And we were talking about that. Um, I am, if you can see here. Here we go. I'm using, this is an AT2020 microphone with a pop filter on the top of it. Um, it's running through a mixer, which is just a USB mixer that's going into my um, laptop. The camera that I'm using in front of me is just a Canon 5D that's running into my laptop as well. And I've got a, a, a light, a ring light that's in front that I can control how much or how little light is on my face. <clears throat> And Andrea asked in the chat earlier, back to personas, is user and customer synonymous when developing personas? Also, how do you personalize Dell to align with your persona segments? Uh, what was that last part? How do you how do you say that again? How do you personalize Dell to align with your persona segments? Shoot, they keep it. How um, how do you align? How do you align what? I'm uh, man. This is terrible. I'm sorry. Oh, digital at home. Digital at home. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Y yes. Okay. I, I was like, no. I was like, no. I don't know. Anyway, user customer. Uh, <laughs> same thing. They're very synonymous. It's 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 the same. It's the same. Um, how do you personalize digital at home to align with your personal segments? Again, once you dive really deep in that conversation that you have when you're running a design sprint or a discovery session, you really start to find out things about your users that you probably never would have thought of before. If you're, if you're in a design sprint session, that's a really good design sprint session. You're going to talk about, uh, you're going to put yourself in their shoes. You're going to talk about the what clothes they wear, what periodicals they read, what television they watch, what do they do for fun? What do they do for work? What do they do for fu fitness? And you really start to break down who that user is or that customer is that you want to attract. And then you start to craft your message around what you think that they're going to like or listen to or what they're going to be emotionally connected with. Uh, right. Mm, I'm losing you. Hold on a second here. All of that broke up. I apologize, Brittany. But I am okay. going to, if you don't mind, see you cut you're coming in and out here. So let's see. Um, oh, hey. Hey, JD, how's it going? <laughs> Marnie's on deck. Mar Marnie's on deck. All right. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly fine. All right, wonderful. So let's see. Um, do, do, do. So there was a question here from uh, Kathleen about personalized ads. Uh, and the capability of having a Porsche driver see one thing, the BMW driver uh, see a different one um, on the same billboard. Uh, she said that on Delta was working billboard? on something like that. Yeah. So it's like, so you have your Porsche driver in one lane, and then you have your BMW driver two lanes over. And it's mm -hmm. apparently the same billboard, uh, but they're different ads. Um, are, you, are you, so it, what was the question? Is it, is it, is the question, is that possible to do or, or is it, what was the question around that? Yeah. One? Is that something that you think, yeah, with, such as like a personalized ad personalizing for a, you know, out of home experience. 
it's interesting wouldn't it be um like if if you were let's say you were porsche right and you wanted to do that where uh if the, if the camera recognized that there was a bmw next to you as you're driving um and you know, wouldn't it be something funny if you put up a message that say something like something like you know point and laugh at that guy or something it looks like it looks like my camera <laughs> um i I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's possible to do that. If it, you know, I I don't know the back end of the technology on whether or not it can recognize both. I'm talking to you while I'm I'm switching out camera batteries, just so you guys know. Um, but it's it, okay. it, it might be possible, and it might be a very interesting it might be a very interesting technology to look into. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Another one came in. Uh, how about some advice on building campaigns for Gen Z? Ooh. Um, well, again, that's going to come into, let me just, I'm going to get live. There we go. I should be back. Um, so the, the question was marketing to Gen Z, building your brand persona in healthcare. What advice would you give when your administrator is stuck on traditional, um, yet Gen Z is not receptive to traditional healthcare. It's very, very interesting. Um, I, it's, ironically enough, I was in healthcare for 15 years before um, I decided to become a designer. Um, and I know that it, it can be very tough and I know administrative um, roles and responsibilities are very tough too. But I think if you have somebody, it, it's really going to come down to that administrator, right? And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to make a really good case to them as to why you should be looking at Gen Z and why they're going to be the future of healthcare and why the administration needs to start making these changes now and start advertising in a way that makes most sense for the Gen Z user. Um, unfortunately, you know, if you've got an administration that's not going to budge on it, it's going to be really, really difficult to change their mind, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of times, like people my, like myself, when we do a brand discovery session, um, we will work with you to craft a message to make sure that the stakeholders are on board. Because if you don't have the stakeholders on board, it's it's not going to work, right? Is, even if you're in the marketing department and you've got a solid plan, if the stakeholders are not behind you, it's not going to work. That's a, that's the unfortunate um, problem with that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, do you have any you know, general advice for young marketers? read do lots of reading do lots of books i mean marketing has been around for a long time and there's so many so much good advice out there and there's so many good things out there a lot of the principles that you would learn in like marketing 101 still hold up today um obviously mediums have changed and the way we deliver ads and 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 the intent behind ads have changed and how we we get those messages out but you can learn a lot of great things from some of the older um older books and and the older guys and women who've been in this industry for a long time. Um, uh, outside of that, just just make sure that you're you're up to date in current events and you and you're staying relevant and you're learning, learning, learning. You're always you always have to be learning, and find yourself uh, so you know really good support systems and, and network. Um, get out there and, and and meet with designers and meet with creative agencies. Um, you know, find somebody the, that would mentor you. Find somebody that you really look up to. Uh, and, and, and see if you can be their shadow for a little bit. Sure. Um, and then the last one, how can young marketers, mid-level marketers really, um, at any stage, how can they get CMO and CEO buy-in for these strategies? Great question. Or golden question. It's a really great question. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. But, but, but look, look, your level of experience um, should not hinder your ability to uh, to grow and to be heard. You have a voice, right? You're, you, it, you, the people who hired you hired you for a reason, and they think that you're going to be a, 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 your commodity for for the, for that job for the whatever company it is that you're working for. Um, so don't ever feel like. Um, you have you're fresh out of college, or you have one or two or three years that it, it's you can't speak to a CMO in a way that the CMO will take your advice or, or believe what you have to say. It can be a little bit um, 
nerve wracking, right? To, to, to think that you have this good idea. And it's like, why should I present this to, to my CMO who's been in this field and industry for a long time? And they've worked their way through the ranks, but you're there for a reason, right? And um, who was it? I think it was Steve Jobs that said that um, you should always hire people who are smarter than you, right? Because that's how you learn. That's mm-hmm. how you grow. Um, so if you were hired and, you, you, and you're there for a reason, and you have a really good idea, you shouldn't be afraid to to approach your CMO and talk to them about it. And if you need help, let me know. I'll speak to them. We'll put a good plan together and we'll call them. <laughs> Sounds good. Cool. Well, that is uh, all the time we have for today. So let's uh, thank JD once again. A little oh, virtual round no. of applause in the chat. Um, but yes, this yeah. concludes our 2020 Experience Design Virtual Conference. And... We would love to continue the discussion on how experience design can shape your business. So what was your uh, biggest takeaway from the two-day event? You can join us in the social lounge for our virtual happy hour to discuss. And thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody. Be good to each other. Wash your hands. Drink some water. <laughs>